This is Power BI and more from CRM Audio with your host, Ulrich Carlson. This episode is brought to you by CRM EG. The Dynamics 365 user group is the world's most influential user group community of Microsoft Dynamics 365 and CRM users and partners. Across the globe, members have a common goal of maximizing and advancing the performance of Microsoft Dynamics 365 so that individuals and companies can improve operations, overcome obstacles, and exceed goals. We thank Dynamics 365 User Group for sponsoring Power BI and more from CRM Audio. Welcome to the Power BI and More podcast. This is Ulrich Carlson, and today I have a special guest for you in Matt Lamp. Matt Lamp is a data scientist. Uh, Welcome to the show, Matt. Hey, Ulrich. Thanks for having me. Hey, Matt. So we're going to be talking about data science and what you do in your work as a data scientist. But um, if you can just tell us a little more about yourself and your, your background and where you're currently working. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. And Ulrich, I guess I'll just start by saying thank you for finally having me on and um, finally addressing data science. As I was preparing for this pod, knowing that I was going to be talking with you about data science and CRM, I did a quick search on Google Trends, and I saw that since 2015, machine learning and data science is up 600% in terms wow. of yeah, in terms of searching. So I think a very relevant topic, so happy to elaborate on Absolutely. that with you today. Absolutely. Thanks um, so, for coming. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, so my background, um, I initially started my career in investment banking, supporting quantitative trading. Um, spent about five years in that space before moving to technology. Um, spent a number of years in technology, supporting operations and sales teams with predictive analytics. So doing a lot of statistical programming, incorporating a lot of AI into their process, using AI as a differentiator to sell and increase revenue. From there, um, it brought me to where I currently work as a consultant at eLogic. All right. So, Matt, when you're talking about like some of your background in quantitative trading, what kind of what yeah. kind of tools are you using there? Are some of those similar to what you're doing now, or is this, this a whole different set? Yeah, yeah. It's a good question. It's funny. It's it's advanced so much in just I'd say the ten to fifteen years, right? When I started doing quantitative trading and supporting traders in that space. Uh, for me, really, as a statistician, um, R was my programming language of choice. So I would create um, algorithms and programming models using R software, right, to help traders understand gaps and spaces um, for profit and for revenue acceleration um, in the equity uh, markets. So a ton of R programming earlier on in my career, you know, since then and since all the advancements in cloud computing, I do a lot of my work now um, in um, software called Azure Machine Learning, right? So I do a lot of that using cloud-based tools um, with superior computing power that have really transformed the space. Again, over the past decade, it's been incredible. Wow. I, I do want to say I still R is still prevalent and prevalent in this, um, you know, in our field in data science. Um, but incorporating that with cloud-based tools as well has been awesome. It's really transformed the job. Right, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but R is also supported in Power BI, right? So when we're working with Power BI and Dynamics Data, we can take advantage of using R. Absolutely, yeah, you, you can, and I've done so, for sure. Right, so would you say that that's more common on, on your projects and that you have to use R? You cannot use the built-in features. You have to take that extra step and use R to to do your your algorithm. So yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, you know, and R just isn't an algorithm tool, right? It's a, it's a statistical modeling tool. I do just because of my familiarity with the language and my comfort and, you know, just have been doing it for so long. I do a lot of my data transformations in R, right? So okay. Even though, you know, I can do that in Power BI. I mean, heck, you could even do it in Excel if you want. I just find that doing mass changes and mass data transformation, I've done it so long in R, it's kind of like a comfort thing. And it's just an efficiency thing for me. So being able to leverage tools and leverage your personal strengths where you're most comfortable, I think is a big advantage these days. Right. So you can use that use that in addition to Power Query, for example. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I'm, I'm sure there are some more uh, statistical components and transformations that you can do with R, which 
probably are not uh, possible in in Power Query by itself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Just by nature, right? It's a statistical programming tool, right? That's its primary purpose. Um, but certainly within Power Query, you can get very, very far. Um, uh, yeah, I'd say you know leveraging both depends on what the application is and what problem I'm trying to solve. Um, but I found just for me and trying to solve big data problems or more complex statistical problems, um, ours been my, my solution of choice. Nice, nice. Yeah. So, so Matt, yeah. with, with your background here, yeah. coming in as and you mentioned yourself as a statistician, right? A, a data yeah. scientist, and we also talk yeah. about machine learning and and <laughs> AI, right? And we, we always hear this joke, right? When you're you're learning, when you're learning AI, uh, taking it in school, it's actually statistics, and when you're implementing it, it's regression algorithms or something, uh, machine learning. Uh, yeah. And when you're but when you're selling it, it's AI. <laughs> so, yeah, so I've seen that change been over the years. In, yeah, in all, kind of been in all those areas and kind of learned the statistics there um, and been doing the machine learning and so on. How do you see AI being used uh, as a term, and how how would you use uh, AI? Can, yeah, we talk, can, we, can we even talk about like real AI versus? Yeah, I don't say yeah, yeah, yeah. AI, but, but <laughs> right, AI, right, pseudo AI. This isn't necessarily artificial intelligence, but you know, advanced statistics, for example. Yeah, yeah, it's funny, Ulrich. I mean, that's a great observation, and it, it's too true, unfortunately. Even now, I'd say, if, again, you know, to bring up like a Google reference here, if you were to, you know, just type in definition of AI, you'd probably get, you know, fifty different responses of what it actually is. Probably a lot more than that. Um, so it's funny, I've seen it kind of morph over the years. AI is certainly kind of the buzz phrase now that, as you mentioned, I think sellers are using, um, maybe it's just has more of a appealing ring to it than, you know, deep learning or machine learning or things like that, that perhaps are, you know, a little, uh, you know, overused, if you will. Right. A new way I see it now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Neural nets are kind of a buzz phrase now. It's so funny. Um, those are actually, so I'll touch on neural networks. We'll, we'll touch on the whole thing here. So, so AI, the way I see it now, um, and the way I've seen it transform over the years, is kind of like an umbrella, right, right, that encompasses, we'll say, data science, statistics, machine learning, deep learning, you know, with deep learning as an output of neural nets. Um, so AI is kind of this, this overarching umbrella, right, where all of what I just described is now encompassed within this new definition of what AI actually is. And I'd say a real general depiction of what AI is in its most simplest terms to me um, could be described as smart machines, right? So machines that can learn from data and improve over time, okay? So within that, again, we said there's machine learning. Within machine learning, there's deep learning. Deep learning, that enters your neural networks, you know, in deep, within deep learning, I have a lot of people or a lot of customers ask me, what does deep mean, right? What, what, what is that about, right? How is that different from machine learning? Um, and you actually touched on a little bit. So deep learning is neural networks and how neural networks actually perform and run their, you know, run the science and math behind it is they have hidden layers, right? So they really try to act. It's funny, right? The neural part is that they're trying to replicate how the brain works right and how neurons are connected so the deep is actually the depth of how many hidden layers there are within that network um so that's where the deep comes from in deep learning <clears throat> i will say deep learning and neural networks are very complex they're very hard to use and they're they're typically used for very big data type problems so very specific use case for those right but i just totally understand why there's a little confusion it's been nebulous as to what exactly ai is Right. So, so when it comes, uh, we bring up when we see AI, I'll, t I'll talk about AI, right? In, in, yep. in context of Dynamics 365, for example, we're looking at lead scoring. We're looking at opportunity mm -hmm. scoring, which can be large, but not, uh, <laughs> wouldn't right. necessarily classify as, as big data we are talking about. So when it comes to like dealing with, with these kind of issues here, um, what, what kind of model? So if, if neural networks or deep learning doesn't really apply here, what were you using in that case? Yeah, it's funny. So, you know, what we're doing um, in terms of like lead scoring or opportunity scoring, I'd say it's a very generous application of the term AI. Um, and that's where I said like the most modern version of what AI is, is kind of that umbrella that incorporates everything. That's 
say prior to that kind of modern definition, AI to me was anything beyond standard pattern recognition. But what mean scoring and opportunity scoring is, is just that it's pattern recognition. So I'd say the new definition of AI captures uh, lead scoring and opportunity scoring, which are classification models, which are essentially pattern recognition algorithms. Right. So what, what kind of value can you get from, from using those model, models there? Because I, I'm curious here, because obviously we can run our big data sets, but sometimes you want to like run it on something you know, right? And I use some of the quick insights from Power BI uh, at some point. Uh, yeah. that, then it goes through and does some pattern recognition and tells you a whole bunch of things about your data set. And I of ran course. it on, uh, on the data from my fantasy football league from the past <laughs> nine or ten years that we've been playing, right? And right. it told me that I was terrible at playing fantasy football. And I was like, tell me something I don't know. Right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, right. I we don't need a neural network for that. Really good guys. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, um, it was kind of like yeah. you know, a lot of stating the obvious in that in in that scenario, and I see we see that too sometimes when we run those uh, um, lead scoring, opportunity scoring model on on leads and and opportunities and so on, and some of the results are saying, you know, we kind of already knew that. So sure. where can you use these models or refine them or use them to dig in and say, hey, we, we, this is where we can actually present some value that you maybe didn't know. Yeah, no, g- great points there too. And I, just I could have told you your fantasy football performance was less than <laughs> ideal without any type of advanced learning or AI, however you want to classify it. But I, I think with lead scoring and more particularly with opportunity scoring, I think the real value there in using some of these predictive classification algorithms is not so much as you said. Like some of them are super obvious, right? We're we're not using an advanced analytics algorithm to determine you know what's already a slam dunk. Right. If they're, you know, if the opportunity looks great and it's, you know, proceeded through all the different sales steps and they're about to sign their repeat customer. Obviously, we know that looks good. I'd say the value in that is really around the opportunities that are kind of like on the fence of being classified as a win. Right. Or maybe you look at it and didn't know it was on the fence. Maybe you thought, hey, that thing's shot. There's no way we're winning that. But the pattern recognition is saying, wait, hold on a second. This opportunity is actually very close to being considered a win. Right. Historically speaking. If you do, you know, maybe one or two things. So I think that's where the value lies. It's finding those opportunities that are in the middle. Like some of them, again, are complete obvious slam dunks or total misses. But finding all of those in the middle that might push you over a threshold or push you toward a goal. um, I think that pattern recognition, specifically opportunity scoring, does a great job of that. Right. And, and I guess when we're looking at these kind of activities, uh, you know, what the machine does great is it's, it's taking a lot of the personal bias out of it and a lot of the recency biases oh, totally. that you have. Totally. You know, I recently talked to these people and I had a good feeling about it and they sounded happy and so on. Um, right, as right. opposed to the cadence of activities and everything else going on and saying the machine will actually tell you one thing, which may align with or could be different from, you know, the impression that you had based on the conversation, which is something that, you know, yeah. I guess a machine we would probably be very, very far away from the machine being able to like record a conversation and give us a feeling about how that <laughs> other person was. Um, uh, how well, you know, there, there, yeah, there, well, there's fall, speech to fall, text, right? so we could do sentiment analysis on that. But yeah, I mean, it, it's probably closer than you think. So I don't know. How, how close do you think that would be? Yeah, well, in terms of sentiment analysis, in terms of finding, you know, a customer's feeling or, uh, you know, as the algorithm states, a sentiment, I think it's really close. Like having speech to text or even just looking at emails, right? And that's one of the offerings in the analytics package, you know, for G365. Um, I think you can get a really good sense from that. And these algorithms are so fine tuned to understand, Hey, that was a positive conversation. Let's use that as a feature into this classification model to help bolster its predictive, its predictive strength. Um, so there's lots of cool things and that, that, that's one of the topics I hope we cover today or maybe in a later session, um, is what type of data really helps create a really powerful algorithm gives you really strong predictions. Right, because uh, then you have like the sentiment, and not just like the recency and the cadence of those emails and activities. Uh, but, yeah, yeah, and I also want to mention. You just made me think of it again. It, I think you brought up a good point. A lot of times in, in implementing and incorporating machine learning, especially opportunity and lead scoring, with I'd say well-developed, mature process sales teams are some of those tenured sales reps or some of those tenured sales managers where. 
I'm coming to them. Maybe I don't have a ton of experience in their specific field, but I have a lot of experience in data and data modeling and predictive um, sales analytics. So I'll go to someone and say, hey, this opportunity, it's not me saying it, it's the data, right? The algorithm saying this opportunity, right, is not going to close. It's just not happening. The data doesn't back it up. And a lot of times it's going against like the gut feeling of a tenured salesperson. And that can be a tough sell. Right. There's ways to get around that, certainly, which you know I've learned over time how to do that best. But um, again, that's one of the great things about data science. It's, it's a scientific method. So there's things like holdout samples and validation where we say, hey, look, if we had applied this algorithm and this type of scoring to all the opportunities last quarter, heck, you know, we would have been right 92% of the time. Not we, the algorithm would have. Right? Right. So you can show through evidence, right, factual data evidence that this thing, these models get super, super fine-tuned and accurate, which is great. Right. So, and are these the common scenarios that uh, when you talk to your customers uh, at eLogic, is that what you're working working with? Yeah, yeah. We found, you know, at eLogic, there's definitely um, a big gap in the market space around sales analytics and advanced sales analytics. Um, so I, I'm talking to them about doing things like opportunity and lead scoring. You mentioned that. Um, there's lots of other opportunities too. And I know you touched on power BI a little bit, even just transparent sales dashboards, sales performance dashboards, pipeline dashboards, um, really provide a ton of insight and they create the groundwork for a good data culture to be able to build upon and actually start doing some more advanced analytics, more predictive analytics, um, that really make your sales organization really smart. All right. So when, when do you define uh, advanced in this context here? Because, you know, obviously I've been, uh, myself, I've been creating lots of dashboards and shots, particularly within Dynamics itself. And now, yeah. of course, with Power BI as well and using the, the but using the Dynamics data. So yeah. when does, in your context, I'm sure your advanced starts at a very different place than, than mine does. <laughs> uh, no, sure. so, so once we have the data here, what else would you do with the data and say, you know, these are the kind of the algorithm is this is the things we can do with it um so to get beyond just doing you know your standard visuals and your standard uh, display of data yeah yeah totally so i see where data is a, i mean it's a gold mine it's a great starting point for any of these sales analytics we're talking about and i think you know we, we call them i guess maybe I, I misspoke and said that maybe it's simplistic or not advanced analytics to do these you know um you know, kind of standard sales reporting like pipeline and sales performance dashboards. By no means is that simplistic. I mean, that can be incredibly insightful um, and incredibly helpful for sales organizations to increase revenue. Um, I'd say when the predictive stuff gets really interesting is when we pair and layer CRM data with other system data. So ERP, right? When we get that transactional um, price and cost and revenue information and pair that with great rich crm data we get some very very meaningful insights and that's where i've seen the most success in terms of predictability and i've seen that really shape and transform businesses right yeah because that's also where you start getting like the full the full view of what's happening with the customer not necessarily just on the sales sides and what we thought we we sold them but also what we actually end up selling them uh, yeah. based on what's in the yeah. system and what got delivered and what kind of services were picked up afterwards and so on. Um, Very so, true. Uh, what tools are you working with when you're doing that? Yeah, so for me, I found the most success using Azure. Um, so traditionally, I bring in ERP data um, and I really don't care what your ERP system is that you're using. I orchestrate that data into an Azure repository I'll orchestrate your CRM data into that same repository. I'll perform the machine learning right in that Azure cloud, right? And we'll come out with meaningful predictions within Azure cloud that are able to be consumed back into your source system. If we want to push, push those or pump those back into CRM, we can certainly do that. Um, we can visualize them and consume them via Power BI. Really unlimited options with what you want to do with those predictions. I just think that it has to be aligned toward right a successful business outcome, I'm going to meet the specific requirements of that use case. But lots of different options there. I found Azure works well for me, um, and it's scalable, too, which is great. Right. Right. And what's your, uh, and do you then use Power BI to display the results back to the, to the customer? Oh, oh, oftentimes I do. Yeah, oftentimes I do. Yeah, it depends. So maybe I'll keep it right in Power BI. Maybe I'll embed it within Dynamics. 
Um, depending on the use case and depending on work, what works best for that customer, what type of data that I'm showing back to them, who needs to consume it, how often they're consuming it, how often it's being refreshed, how often the model's being retrained. Um, there's a lot of components that, get, that go into that. Um, but certainly we present it in a way which is, I'd say, best consumed by the end user. Right. Right. And Matt, I'm, I'm curious because you're mentioning all these these uh, machine learning algorithms and what you're doing, <laughs> and, and your title is as, da- yeah. as a data scientist, right? Yeah. Because yeah. the umbrella of data science, what what exactly does that entail? And anybody saying, okay, well, data scientists, what what do you actually do there? What what's included there? We talk about statistics, we talk about selecting yeah. algorithms and machine <laughs> learning. What what do you consider yeah. to be included there in the in the data science umbrella? Good question, Ulrich, and I think it's actually it's broad these days, and it keeps expanding. Um, woohoo! Uh, yeah, so a, there's a tradition. Loose, it's kind of like <laughs> it is, it's often, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I know it, it, it's it's falling into that same category. I know it's funny. So I just read an article recently of the I think three different types of data scientists that are available in the market today, and it's really expanded. It keeps expanding. So I just spoke about you know a few different Azure terms. Right. And some data scientists have strengths within, I'd say, cloud architecture, less so on the statistics and modeling side, but they know how to move data around. They know SQL, right? They might know some R. They can leverage some of those cloud based tools like Azure Machine Learning that I spoke about. But I'd say stronger on the cloud architecture, right? And the data transformation side. Then there's the traditional data scientist. Um, that's really all about the, st- the statistics, right? So understanding models, understanding the mathematics behind those, how they work, what model's most appropriate for what data set, for what problem you're trying to solve, and really how to hypertune, right, and transform those models. That can be an incredibly time-consuming um, space as a data scientist, right? So having the experience of using different algorithms, and there are many algorithms out there, understanding what works best for your data set being able to compare them, evaluate your models, score your models, and select the most meaningful and effective model, but then tuning that model, right, for continued impor- uh, performance improvements. Um, I think that's probably the second, what I'd call, um, you know, traditional data scientist. I'd say lastly and third is like the, the data um, data scientist who's more, more business-oriented, so understanding business requirements, right, and business outcomes, and transforming that or taking that, ingesting that information and creating models, defining that problem within a data science context and understanding more from a business perspective, less technical. So on the other end of the spectrum from that cloud architect um, and building it and approaching problems that way. In the end, though, everyone needs to know the models and how to tweak and tune them and know which model to choose and how to evaluate them. I think that's the crux of being a data scientist. Right, because that's where you define the results, right? That way you can tune the results and of what, what you're getting and what you're returning to the customer. In. Very true. I think, you know, the three profiles that I described, I mean, they all have their different advantages. You can be great technically, but if you can't understand and clearly define the business problem you're trying to solve, pretty useless. And, and vice versa, right? If you have a great business problem, you solve it. You know, how do you implement that and operationalize that model with limited technical skill sets? I think you'll fall short there as well. So really, an ideal candidate would have kind of a blend of a little bit of all those, right? Okay. So if you're going to put yourself in those boxes there, what, what ratio between those different roles would you would you put yourself? Yeah, I think earlier on in my career, it was more on the technical side. So I wasn't doing a lot of business interface or customer interface. I was working, as I mentioned, you know, in investment banking. So I was working with traders, but I was just doing the mathematics. So I was primarily just our programming. Um, so super technical, super, you know, statistician based. So I'd say probably more on, you know, the architecture, IT guy, uh, and traditional data scientist. As my career has progressed, I've had more interface with, you know, business decision makers, been faced with different types of business problems outside of investment banking. So broad nice. problems that, right. So I think I've kind of just naturally transitioned more to the center leaning right. Um, you know, for me, though, I still like I was just doing some modeling last night um, and I still incorporate R in all of my machine learning models. Right. I don't I don't solely deter or just depend on, you know, AML Studio, for instance. Right. Where a lot of that's I'd say you don't need to know how to R program or Python program to able to create to be able to create models in that space. 
um, I still do. Um, and part of it is, is it, right, if you don't use it, you lose it. So I want to stay fresh in my programming skills, but also be aware of, you know, creating cloud-based models that are scalable. Um, but right. yeah, I think I try to have a blend of all three of those profiles, and I, I consciously seek to do that. Right. Sounds awesome. So yeah. one of the reasons here, we, we definitely want to talk about data science and AI and machine learning here on, on Power BI Mall, because we've been we're very dynamic 365 oriented, because, you know, that's where we come from. That's what we're working with. Of course. Love it. Uh, and of course, Microsoft have been commoditizing some of those AI features and machine learning features over the recent years. Yeah. Uh, and those features are kind of just about to come out now. The uh, AI for sales, for example, is in preview. Uh, yeah. I've been talking a lot in the past about the customer insights, which uh, I think we're unfortunately not going to get as a Microsoft product, um, but has some of those same features where I would basically go in and define what you would do in machine learning too. So I, I, do, I take my opportunities, I would group them up and say, here's the ones that I lost. Here's the opportunities that I won. The lost ones are bad. The won ones are good. And then it would basically, <laughs> by itself, run whatever algorithms it did in the background and come back and tell me and score all the open opportunities, give them a percentage yeah. of my chances of winning. And it would also give me a list of signals and saying, this is actually the, that material that we use to to base that information on and say, you know, based on the communication or certain types of opportunities or people that were involved with them and so on. And so I'm very curious here from your perspective because, and, and this happens to all roles, right? And all of our specialties, doesn't matter what you're doing, Microsoft will just basically, you know, yeah. Yeah. every release that's going to take a little bit. <laughs> Of, of your specialty <laughs> yeah. area and commoditize it, right? Yeah. And that's not something that's going to happen to the data scientists. Right. Yeah, so, so now, they're, know, now they're coming for you. So, so what is it that <laughs> you say, looking at these new features here, you, you bring to the table that wouldn't really necessarily be possible to, to do in a, in a prepackaged product? Yeah, totally, totally. And I just want to say, I, I agree. I can't believe they're coming after data scientists now. I mean, the nerve. But yeah, I, I'm happy. I'm happy that they're embedding that and, you know, quote unquote, commoditizing it to some degree. I think that, you know, data science and predictive analytics is a huge sales and revenue enabler. So the fact that that's becoming more normal for sales teams to accept, I think helps the data science community, you know, collectively and as a whole. So so happy that, you know, obviously Microsoft putting their power behind it um, and really getting it out there for users who may have been skeptical before, or, you know, cautious of using this, you know, mysterious magic AI um, to help improve their sales process and, and revenue acceleration. I'm all for that. Um, I will say it's hard. I mean, and, and again, I'm happy they're doing it. it. It's hard to just pick a one size fits all approach with data science. So sure, I can run. And I can shove your opportunities or your leads into any type of classification algorithm. By the way, there's a lot of different algorithms that do that. Microsoft's using one for this kind of out of the box, um, you know, AI for sales feature that they're offering, right, for, for a price. Um, so they're using one algorithm, right? And that'll work and that'll give you results. You know, there, there's no tuning. I'm unsure of how they retrain it. And how do I know that that algorithm is the best algorithm for your type of opportunities and your type of data? So. Okay. You know, so yes, I think it's good. I think it gets you started well, and I think absolutely it'll help your business. I don't think you get the customization, you get the full impact of, you know, what data science can do for you, or even just opportunity scoring can do for you, just relying on that. Right. And of course, there's an assumption that when you use the prepackaged product, right, you, you, that you use Dynamics 365 pretty much out of the box, right? If you yes. have done too many customizations, et cetera, those can be You're, fairly hard to implement into that model, right? Good point. Good point. Um, yes. I, I think to, to maybe to defend your job <laughs> in data science a little bit <laughs> and the different roles that you were talking about where I see Microsoft making a lot of things a lot easier because yes, we're going to get these commoditized AI products, which, which looks great and it's going to be great. But you can always do more with the algorithms and the exact data that you're working with and so on. What I think is going to make a huge difference, and which may make a difference to to somebody in your role, and you're talking about like you know where you spend your time doing these different things on transforming data, um, yeah. talking to business decision makers, and making those actual algorithms. So we're looking at, for example, like the data flows, for example, and the new. Um, 
Azure Data Lake Generation 2 um, yeah. and how we can take uh, data from Dynamics 365 and basically fairly easily put it in a data flow, which is based on this new Azure Data Lake. And mm-hmm. therein, automatically have access to um, Azure Machine Learning and running all those yeah. different kinds of models. So that job that could have been fairly time consuming on transforming and just moving their data around to get it into Azure Machine Learning and doing all those other things. A, you know, a lot of those barriers are going to be broken down and we can focus a lot on the, um, say, the the clever work or the, the work, the work yeah. where the magic happens, right? On refining those algorithms, <laughs> working with the data to get those results back. Um, yeah. So that's definitely going to be a lot of yeah. tools to there. Yeah, I, I know. Super excited to see that. Happy they put the investment there. You're right. It does it does kind of decrease the barrier there. That data transformation is a huge barrier and time consumer, you know, for really any data scientist and anyone working with data. Um, but to have that, right, that orchestration already occurring, to have some of that transformation done is a huge, uh, um, I'd say, time accelerator. So uh, it allows data scientists like me who want to get to the algorithms and start modeling data. It, it cuts down our time to do that and we get to uh, do what we like. All right. So, Matt, I think... That all sounds really interesting, and you know, I think we should pick this up on some some future episodes and really dig into what we can do with the Dynamics data and what yeah. we expect from Dynamics data when we start working with um, working with those formulas and working with Dynamics 365 and how we can how we can do it and maybe compare it a little more closely to what Microsoft is doing. Um, do you have any particular areas on on what we what we can discuss or what you think would be interesting to discuss in future episodes? Yeah, Ulrich, I think that's a great idea to, to pick up on, you know, another session. Um, I think we did a good broad kind of overview of machine learning and maybe how to use that, generally speaking, with CRM data. Um, but, yeah, let's let's talk about more specific use cases. Let's talk about um, things that Microsoft specifically is bringing to market. Um, I can give you my data science view on that, where I think it's most advantageous. I think who the best customers are to use, you know, the sales for AI um, and certainly happen to, happy to jump into some of the other kind of more cutting edge, more recent sales analytics algorithms that I've been using lately. So, for instance, maybe right. collaborative filtering or recommender systems, we can you know, spend some time discussing that. Right. Yeah. Right. Wait, so you said collaborative filtering. Yes. Recommender uh, <laughs> system. So is that, is that a, a recommendation engine? It is. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. It's a recommendation engine. All right. So, and it's called collaborative <laughs> filtering. Well, I guess we, I guess we can bring that up. <laughs> on exactly Maybe we'll start how, right there on the next one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Happy to do that. <laughs> All right. No, I'm at. Thank you very much for for uh, attending the podcast here. I'm really looking forward to to discussing some of these areas in more details and really talk about those those different types of algorithms and how we can use it with the dynamics data and how we yeah. can augment add on to what. Microsoft otherwise give us an um, out of the box AI features, uh, and have a good discussion on that. Um, you definitely had some some great insights here um, from being a data scientist. So, if anyone out there listening want to read more of what you've been doing, or see more of what you've been doing, where can they get a hold of you or see that? Yeah, Ulrich, absolutely. Um, happy to be here. Happy to do this with you. You can go and take a look at the eLogic website. Um, we have a blog section there where you could see some of my latest work and some of my views um, on CRM and sales and data science and all other interesting and relevant topics. All right. Any Twitter handles? No Twitter handle as yet. No Twitter handle. All right. Yeah, well, yeah I know. We'll, we'll add a link if it's coming. All right. So the eLogic <laughs> block for now. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. And looking forward to talking to you again. Sam Allward, thanks for having me.